So one day they were told, take your King James Bibles, and as they came in they were given a thick black pen, and they were told, now, let's modify the King James. Cross out, zap, 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 whatever it is, and they crossed out. They didn't have their Bible. It didn't exist in the early 1900s, so the Jehovah's Witnesses were the first to just cross out huge sections of the Bible. I'll show you that tomorrow night, what they crossed out. And it must be emphasized that the argument is therefore not between an ancient text and a recent one, but between two ancient texts. Are you with me? That's the argument. And, uh, well, it's an interesting one. Now Tyndall, he of course used the received text, and this really irritated the Vatican. Because the other one hadn't been found yet, by the way. And he used the received text in his Bible and said to the Pope, if God spare my life before many years, I will cause a boy that driveth a plow to know, know more about the scriptures than thou doest. That was quite a statement. Once again, I would like to reiterate, the argument is not King James versus other versions. The argument is received text, textus recepticus, versus the small little stream that comes from Sinai, and the Vatican. That's the argument. By the way, any Bible in any language that existed before the 1900s is received text. So if you go to Serbia, they have the received text. If you go to Greece, they have the received text in Greek. If you go to any country in the world, the Lutheran Bible, any Bible, they're all based on received text. Every single one. But after 1900, the modern ones are no longer based on that. Well, when this Bible came out, the Jesuits were called in to help. Big crisis. Because now it was plain that the teaching of Rome was not in accordance with the Bible. And this is one of their statements. Notice what the Jesuits wrote. We must undermine the Bible of the Protestants and destroy their teachings. The Queen of England, realizing the damage the Jesuit Bible could do, sent to Europe for Bazaar, who was with John Calvin, to help Cartwright to write this new uh, manuscript. Uh, he took hold of the Greek manuscripts and the Latin manuscripts from the received text, and he hit the Jesuit Bible blow after blow. So, war broke out. So eventually they sent the Spanish Armada against England to make war, and they came with 136 armed ships with 50 cannons, and all England had was a measly 30 ships. These huge galleys came, they were going to flatten England because of this Bible. Well, Sir Francis Drake got up that morning, he must have been very nervous, but what did he find? A storm had come up in the night, and the Spanish galleys lay smashed upon the shores as high up as Scotland. The entire fleet destroyed in the storm. And all that he had to do was mop up. And from that day, England became a great sea power. That's history. Now, what did the Jesuits say about the Bible? Here's the quote. Then the Bible, that serpent which is with its head erect and eyes flashing, flashing, threatens us with its venom while it trails along the ground, shall be challenged into a rod, changed into a rod as soon as we are able to seize it. For three centuries past, this cruel asp has left us no repose. You well know with what folds it entwines us and with what fangs it gnaws us. They hated the Bible. The Jesuit Catechism, there is the quote, says, Question, what if the Holy Scriptures command one thing and the Pope another contrary to it? Answer, the Holy Scriptures must be thrown aside. What is the Pope? He is the Vicar of Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and there is but one judgment seat belonging to God and the Pope. That's quite a statement. Now, what is Freemasonry saying? It's always nice to have the comparative documents. Morals and Dogma, the source, page 818. Regarding the Bible, Pike writes, the absurd reading of the established church, taking literally the figurative, allegorical, and 
mythical language of a collection of oriental books of different ages, well, it's pretty derogatory, the folly of regarding the Hebrew books as if they had been written by the unimaginative, hard, practical intellect of the England of James I, and the bigoted stolidity of Scottish Presbyterianism. Boy, he didn't like that translation. He hated it. And how did he feel about the Templars and the Jesuit version? The better to succeed and win partisans, the Templars sympathized with regrets for dethroned creeds. They sympathized with paganism and encouraged the hopes of new worships, promising to all liberty of conscience and a new orthodoxy that should be synthesis of all the persecuted creeds. So you see, Freemasonry hates the received text. It has it in its lodge purely as a symbol. That's so clever. That's so diabolical, isn't it? That's, ah, forget it. Going back to the time of the early church, we find Coptic versions, Latin versions, Syrian versions, and they were circulated long before the Vaticanus appeared. So, then come two Cambridge professors who did not even believe in verbal inspiration of the scriptures, Westcott and Hort, and they're going to change everything now. By the way, Jerome's Bible, which is the one that is used in the Vatican, the Latin Vulgate, how could Helvidius, a contemporary, have accused Jerome of employing corrupt Greek manuscripts if Helvidius had not had pure Greek manuscripts? So while Jerome was writing this Latin Bible, other scholars were already saying, hey, you're using corrupt manuscripts for this. So this battle is an ancient battle. It's not a new battle. So these revised versions are based on manuscripts from Egypt that were definitely corrupted. That's what most of the critics say. One of the greatest critics of all time is Dean Bergen. And when this great man died, then corruption took hold. He was a bastion. Bergen writes, the work of the evangelists and apostles, apostles recognized as the necessary counterpart and complement of God's ancient scripture become the New Testament. And then he says, it received as good a reception as did Jesus Christ himself. They nailed Jesus to the cross. Would not they nail his word to the cross as well? That's basically what he says. Restless malice and unsparing assaults against the word of God from the very beginning. And he, what does he say about these manuscripts that were found? He says, we oppose facts to their speculation. They exalt B and Aleph and D8 because in their own opinions these copies are the best. They weave ingenious webs and invent subtle theories because their paradox of a few against the many requires ingenuity and subtlety for its support. Very good writer. He took them apart. I am utterly disinclined to believe, continues Dietz Bergson, so grossly improbable does it seem that at the end of 1,800 years, 995 copies out of every thousand suppose will prove untrustworthy, and that the one, two, three, four, or five which remain, whose contents were still yesterday as good as unknown, will be found to have retained the secret of what the Holy Spirit originally inspired. Interesting point of view. He further goes on to say, what in the meantime is to be thought of those blind guides, those deluded ones who would now, if they could, persuade us to go back to those same codices of which the church had already purged herself. Go back to those ancient manuscripts. And he takes Tischendorf, the man who discovered this manuscript, takes him apart, takes Tregellis apart, Hort apart, and uh, shows that he thoroughly disagrees with their scholarship. And then this interesting statement. Who but those with Roman Catholic sympathies could ever be pleased with the notion that God preserved the true New Testament text in secret for almost 1,000 years and then finally handed over to the Roman pontiff for safekeeping. That's what it boils down to. That's literally what it boils down to. Dr. Hoskia quotes from Dr. Salmon. He says, Naturally, Hort regarded these manuscripts as most trustworthy 
which give the reading recognized by Oregon. See? That's what they did. Hort, the professor from England, he was an Oregon follower. And we will have to prove that. We can't just make statements like that. You will always be my friend, but I can no longer ignore the criticism. This is Dr. Frank Lockson to F. Lockman, one of the great translators himself. I cannot refute them, and dear brother, I have not a thing against you, but the only thing I can do under God is to renounce every attachment to the new American Standard Bible. So here's one of the committee detaching himself personally. Well, let's go to Alexandria and see what we can find. Here is the statue of Horus, the secret of the initiated ones. Horus and Isis and Dionysius, these secrets were kept alive at Alexandria, and the Alexandrian library was world, world famous for its occult documents. Then, of course, the very early Christians who were Bible-based got rid of that terrible uh, information place, and they burnt the old Alexandrian library to the ground, which was a catastrophe for the occult world. Well, fortunately, UNESCO, and this is very interesting, UNESCO, whose constitution was written by a Skull and Bones member, just for interest's sake, decided to restore it and rebuild it in exactly the same spot. There it is today. And uh, the lamps that they've put down, they have interesting stuff on them, like little angels carrying cornucopias, which we discussed yesterday. If you go and look at the library... It is huge, and it has all the pagan inscriptions on it that the original library had on it. It is made according to the model. All the pagan petroglyphs and the ancient sun worship symbols are on it. And this is Demetrius of Falerium, the founder of the Alexandrian uh, library. In it, they still have some of the ancient manuscripts that happened to escape. Here you have papyrus of the zodiac sign, something that the Bible forbids. Here you have a piece of the Book of the Dead, which is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which is the counterpart to what the Bible teaches. It exalts the God of the dead. The Bible exalts the God of the living. Then you have these petroglyphs here, which are too disgusting, so let's just go away. And they have the deities in their hexagons and Socrates, an ancient mystic. Socrates, of course, died from drinking hemlock. He was an initiate, and he released some of the secrets. And according to the oath, if you do that, you can die of the poison cup if you choose, or you could have your throat slit from ear to ear and uh, your tongue ripped out of your mouth. He chose the hemlock. The dead are exalted. This library is absolutely enormous. One cannot even imagine how big it is. I made one small video of it. Let's have a look what it looks like. Just to give you an idea of the size, it's absolutely enormous. And uh, all the interesting pagan symbols are there. A total replica of what once must have existed there. Well, just to show that I was there, because otherwise people think I wasn't, taken from high up in the library, it was opened by uh, Mubarak in 2002. It's spanking new, spanking new. I had to go and see it. I had to go and photograph it. And uh, here they have a statue of Prometheus bearing the fire. According to the occult writings, that's Lucifer, the light bearer, and some of the symbols on the walls, on the retaining walls. Now, let's just have a look at some of the manuscripts which Rome says are essential for um, understanding the greater gospel. And Rome placed the Bible, and that is only the Textus Recepticus, by the way, on the index of prohibited books. They didn't place their Vulgate on the index of prohibited books. It's the Protestant Bible that they placed there. So the early church of Antioch, as I've already said, used these Sy Syrian manuscripts, and this is a book that uh, is forbidden by Rome. The Septuagint, on the other hand, was made for Alexandria, for the library there, in 285 BC. So interesting 
um, data. The apocryphal books, that means hidden things. The Council of Trent said the following in 1546. Whoever shall not receive as sacred and canonical all these books and every part of them as they are commonly read in the Catholic Church and are contained in the old Vulgate Latin edition or shall knowingly and deliberately despise the aforesaid traditions, let him be accursed. So they said we must accept all of these manuscripts. Let's briefly run through them. Let's go to Tobias 6 verses 4 to 8 where it says, Open the fish and take the heart and the liver and the gall. If a devil or an evil spirit trouble any, we must make a smoke thereof before the man or the woman, and the party shall no longer be vexed. As for the gall, it is good to anoint the man that has witness in his eyes, and he shall be healed. So if you want to drive away evil spirits, demons, then wave the gall of a fish and make the smoke thereof, and it will go away. The Bible says, and signs will follow those believing these things. In my name they shall cast out demons, Mark 16, 17. Acts 16, verse 18 says, Being distressed and turning to the demonic spirit, Paul said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her, and it came out that hour. So he didn't use the gallbladder of a fish. Tobias 12, verse 9 says, For arms does deliver from death and shall purge away sin. Oh, that's nice, so you can pay to get your sins taken away. Peter says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Two opposing doctrines. Which one is right? Do you think you can buy your way to heaven? Prayer to the dead, Maccabees 12, verse 43 to 46, For if he had not hoped that they were slain, would he have risen again? It had been superfluous and vain to pray for the dead. Whereupon he made reconciliation for the dead, that they might be delivered from sin. So you can pray for the dead that they are delivered from sin? This is paganism. John 1, 7 says, Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. There's no such thing. That brings us to the Vulgate Bible, 1545 to 1563. That was the one which was declared infallible. Now what does the Vulgate say? Our Bible says all Scripture is God-breathed. The Douay, which is based on the Vulgate, says all Scripture is inspired of God is profitable. So only some Scripture is inspired. Hebrews 11.21 says, Jacob worshipped as he leaned on top of his staff. The Vulgate says, Jacob adored the top of his rod. That means you can pray to a relic. You can pray to a statue. That's where they get their doctorate from. It also says in Revelation, in the received text, blessed are they, oh no, this is Codex Vaticanus, blessed are they which wash their robes. But the King James says, blessed are they that do his commandments. Well, the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were writings meticulously copied by the Essenes. The ancient manuscripts that they copied were exactly like those found in the Bible today. So they proved that the Bible had not changed in all this time. And these manuscripts were very exciting. But then some other Interesting manuscripts have been found besides this famous uh, one that was found near Alexandria. And that is a whole series of Gnostic Gospels. And Time magazine reported on these some time ago. Words from the past. 46 scriptures dug up near Nag Hammadi in Egypt in 1945 changed views of early Christianity. Now, interestingly, Egypt was the seat of the occult science, and these were buried to keep them safe. From whom? Obviously, the early Christianity that destroyed that ancient pagan library, and these manuscripts have now been found since 1945 and are changing the world view. Some Buddhists are saying, had we known that Christianity had such manuscripts, we needn't even have been Buddhists. Well, what do these manuscripts say? 
These are the so-called lost Gospels that are so famous today. You have the Gospel of Thomas, the Gospel of Peter, and all these wonderful manuscripts throwing light on what the early Christians believed. Well, there were Ebionites, there were Marcionites, there were Gnostics, there were Thomasines. All of them basically believed in the deity of man and the non-exclusive deity of Jesus Christ. All of them. Let's read what the Gospel of Peter had to say that was dug up, and you tell me whether you think this is trustworthy. Well, let's read it. By the way, these uh, Gnostic writings are apocryphal, and therefore they are sacred. The cross talked and walked. Jesus had died the day before, uttering his last words. My power, O oh power, you have left me behind. His body was taken down and placed in the tomb, but now, as the Sabbath dawned, oops, which day is now the Sabbath? Sunday has become the Sabbath here. The Sabbath, as Sunday, was kept only in Alexandria, in the Egyptian realm, and in Rome. The rest of the world kept Sabbath, the seventh day. So in this one, the Sabbath has moved to Sunday. Sabbath dawned, a great voice came from the sky, is that trustworthy? Well, let's see how, rest, how trustworthy the rest is. A great voice came from the sky, and two men descended. The stone blocking the tomb rolled away of its own accord. The Bible doesn't say that. And while Roman soldiers gaped, three men emerged from the tomb, two of them supporting the other. Oh, Jesus couldn't walk when he came out. His resurrection was, you know, not quite that illustrious. With a cross following behind. Oh, all by itself. Was the cross buried with him? No, the cross walked behind. Why? Because they made the cross a very prominent symbol in those days. The heads of the two reached up to the sky, but the head of the one they were leading went up above the sky. And they heard a voice, Have you preached to those who are sleeping? So here we have doctrine of preaching to the dead. And a reply came from the cross. Yes. Do you trust this gospel? If you do, I feel sorry for you. I think it belongs where that other one was found, in the trash. <laughs> Let me take you to Sinai. Well, I was interested to go to St. Catherine's, where this manuscript, this famous manuscript on which all modern translations are based, was found. Here it is, St. Catherine's Protectorate. This is the monastery, the famous monastery. Here are the skulls of the monks that uh, were active there. And if you like, you can pray to them and get a blessing. They will answer you.